Uprising, Chapter 20, Page 177, Yetta. Yetta crowded into a rental hall with Rahel and Bella and hundreds of other workers to listen to the union officials talk. A new proposal had come in from the manufacturers who hadn't settled yet, even Triangle. It's a very, it's a really quite generous offer, the union man said from behind his podium. Shorter hours, fair wages, four holidays a year. With full pay, no more petty fines, and charges for thread, for needles. It's almost everything you've been asking for. What about the union? Yetta called out. Are they going to recognize the union? After all the time she spent picketing and trampling around in the snow, her voice was too hoarse to carry to the front of the room. But others picked up her cry. Can we keep our union? Will they give us a closed shop? What's a closed shop, Bella whispered. It means that the factories will only hire union members. If they can hire anyone they want, why would they bother negotiating with us, Yetta said. Why would they bother following any of the rules they agree to if they can just hire non-union workers and treat them anyhow, however they want? The man at the podium held up his hand, trying to silence the questions. Now, now, he said, you'll have to be willing to compromise. You can't expect to win everything. That's, uh, he looked down at his notes as if he needed extra help. That's the one concession the manufacturers weren't willing to make. No closed shops, no union recognition. So we'll have to make the best of the circumstances. Now, if you're ready to vote on this fine proposal, voting's no good without the union, yet a shout it. What do you think we've been fighting for? That was almost as bad as when the Triangle owner started a fake union. Yetta had to remind herself that this man was supposed to be representing her and the other workers, not the owners. At least she wasn't alone in her outrage. Around her, others began shouting, That's a terrible proposal. Send it back. I won't vote on that. Girls who were standing on tables just so they could see began stopping their feet. Other girls leaned over banisters, calling out, For this, I've been starving for three months. For this, I went to the workhouse. Now, calm down, the man behind the podium said. We have to be reasonable. That's all Yetta could hear before his voice was drowned out by a chant flowing through the, u- flowing through the hall. Union! 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 The man gathered up his papers and scurried away. The chanting girl spilled out onto the streets, too riled up to notice the cold. Yetta thought it would be great to have another automobile parade now while everyone was so excited, or to march to City Hall again, as the striker, strikers had done in early December. But it was night now, and dark. There was nowhere to go but home. By the time they reached their own tenement, the cold had seeped through their clothes again. Bella's face was almost blue in the light from the street lamps, and Yetta's teeth were chattering. I wonder if that was wise, Rahel said, as the three of them stood warming themselves over the feeble heat of the stove. You mean rejecting that ridiculous offer? Yetta asked. Of course it was wise. That that offer was nothing. Maybe it was the best we could get, Rahel said. Without union recognition, Yetta said incredulously. They have us back at our machines and five minutes later, five minutes later, some boss will be whispering into some girl's ear. Yes, I know you're supposed to work only 10 hours today, but I'll need you to stay late. Or I know we're not supposed to be any more fines, but I saw you break that needle. That's five cents off your pay this week. Without the union, without closed shops, what could she do? And did you see how excited everyone was? Bella asked, her eyes shining. Rahel looked sadly at the two younger girls. Excited, yes, she said. But it was like a riot of skeletons. Did you see how feeble everyone is becoming? I wager not a single girl in there had a decent meal today. And there was so much coughing and sneezing as cheering. There was as much coughing and sneezing as cheering. The girl beside me was burning up with fever and so weak her friends had to hold her up. And Bella, you're not completely well yourself. I'm fine, Bella insisted, but she couldn't help coughing. Her face still looked blue, even indoors. The rich women are still helping us out, yet to argue. Why, the three of us still have the money Jane gave us. Except for the part that we gave the union, Rahel said, and what we spent on rent and everything we spent on food, we can't live on that money much longer. Yetta stamped her feet with impatience. There's still a rally with the rich women next week, she said, at Carnegie Hall. But when the night of the rally arrived, January 2nd, 1910, 
a brand new year, yet it could feel a difference in the air. Maybe it was because of Rahel, who sat staring off into the space, into space, her face blank, even as the speakers up on stage praised the strikers' courage, their perseverance, their cause. Maybe it was because Yetta heard so many of the rich people grumbling as they left, a little too radical for my taste, frankly. And isn't it appalling how those socialites, socialists, are deluding those poor little girls? One man in a tuxedo, pushing his way out the door near Yetta, complained, I hear the union turned down a perfectly good offer. The girls who are still striking are just lazy. They don't want to work. That's not true, Yetta yelled and began fighting through the crowd to get to the man to make him understand. Yetta, no, Rahel said and pulled on her arm to hold her back. But, Yetta protested, it was too late. The man had already disappeared into the crowd. Yetta turned to complain to Rahel, who bumped directly into Jane Wellington. Jane was beaming at her. I saw you from across the hall, Jane panted, tugging at her corset as if desperate for air. I thought I'd never catch up. How are you? How's the strike going? Fine, Yetta said. I've been so worried about you and Bella, Jane said. I've wanted to come down to the picket line, but Miss Millhouse practically has me under lock and key. I had to sneak out tonight, but I want to help so much. I think soon. The crowd surged forward, separating Yetta and Jane. Yetta made no effort to get back to her. It was too depressing. Jane had so much money. She lived in a mansion. She owned more dresses than stores did. She had servants waiting on her hand and foot. If a girl like Jane could be kept under lock and key, what hope was there for a girl like Yetta? It's over, Rahel said. Yetta blinked up at her sister. Normally, Yetta wasn't so much for sleeping late, but it was February now. Yetta had six more weeks of picketing through snowdrifts and, scra- and screaming herself hoarse and being, and being beaten up and arrested. Earlier this morning, Yetta crawled out of bed and immediately fell into the floor. Rahel had insisted on tucking her back into the blankets. Bella and I can take your picketing slots today, Rahel told them. Rahel told her then, one day in bed will do you a world of good and it won't hurt the strike at all. Yetta had fallen directly back to sleep. She wondered if she still was dreaming, imagining that Rahel had had returned. Got to get back to striking, she murmured, struggling to lift her head from the pillow. No, Yetta, didn't you hear me? Rahel said, her voice firm and all too real. The strike is over. They sent us home. Yetta gasped, fully awake now. She sat up straight, drawing on some reserve of energy she hadn't known she had. You voted, she asked, without me? Rahel shook her head. The union leaders settled, she said. They want us to go back to work. No vote, she croaked out. She squinted into the dim lights coming from the next room. Did we, did we win? Triangle said they give us higher wages and shorter hours, Rahel said. But not a closed shop, Bella added. Then that's not good enough, Yetta said. That's just what we turned down in December, what we refused to vote on. Everyone's tired, Yetta, Rahel said. She sounded tired herself, like some old crone who lived a long, hard life. But the strike was going so well, Yetta said. The college girls are still donating money. The Yiddish theaters had those benefit plays. George Bernard Shaw himself sent a telegram about the strike. Never mind that she hadn't heard of George Bernard Shaw until the telegram. He was some famous playwright in England. In England. Rahel sat down on the edge of the bed and stroked Yetta's hair, just like she had when Yetta was a little child. So much spirit, she said, she murmured sadly. Yetta, can't you see? It had to end. The society women are arguing with the socialists. The union leaders want to be done with us so they can get started with the cloakmaker strike. They just think they can win that one because it's all men, Yetta said bitterly. Rahel didn't disagree. Our people have been waiting Thousands of years for the Messiah, Rahel said. You can't expect to change the world in a few short months. Five months, Yetta corrected her angrily. Five months of freezing and starving and all but killing ourselves to say, Look, world, we matter. So what if we're poor? So what if we're girls? So what if our English isn't so great? The bosses owe us 
common, some common decency. We deserve to be treated like human beings. And now, now you're just going to sit down at your machine, again, quiet as a mouse, and sew when the bosses say so, and stop when the bosses say stop, and let them tell you when you're allowed to use the facilities, and when you can get it only an Apple turnover for working late, and no, Rahel said quietly, it's not, I'm not going to do that. Yetta was surprised to see that Rahel was still shaking. What other choice do we have? Yetta demanded. Rahel looked down. She was twisting her hands in her lap nervously. Maybe now is the best time to tell you. What? Rahel looked up. Maybe her eyes were blazing passionately. Maybe they were dull and glazed. Yetta couldn't tell in the dim light. I'm going to marry Mr. Cohen. Rahel said, and her voice was as firm as slamming a door, revealing nothing else. For a minute, Yetta just stared at her sister, speechless. She felt suddenly that she didn't know her sister very well, had never known her very well. Then she gulped and asked, Who's Mr. Cohen? From my English class, Rahel said. You met him on the sidewalk that one night after we walked Bella home. He's been courting me. If it hadn't been for the strike, he would have been taking me to movies and dances, bringing me flowers. But as it is, he asked me to marry him. Yetta leaned back against the iron frame of the bed, trying to make sense of this, trying to make sense of her sister. Do you love him? Yetta asked, her voice strangely shy and husky. Rahel shrugged. I think so. But what do I know about love? How can I be sure? She asked. He's very handsome, his English is good, and he owns his own grocery. I can help him in the store so he doesn't have to hire anyone else. And maybe later, when there's more business or when we have babies, he could hire you too. So you wouldn't have to work in the factory either. You can live with us, of course. Yetta tried to picture this life Rahel was describing. Rahel is the storekeeper's wife. Yetta as the spinster aunt, servant, juggling a crying baby as she stands on the ladder, reaching for cans of food, trying to calm customers who grumble about broken crackers, rotten tomato tomatoes, spoil bologna. That wasn't Yetta. Yetta was a shirtwaist striker. Not anymore. Yetta glared at Rahel. If you wanted Mama's life, why did you bother leaving the Shetlow? Yetta asked coldly, are you a revolutionary or not? Oh, Yetta, Rahel said despairingly. I was always a better revolutionary in your mind than in reality. But in Russia, I was just an ignorant girl from the Shetlow. Everyone in the movement was so sophisticated and they knew everything. And the boys were so handsome. So, of course I joined. The leaders didn't even know my name. I didn't know anything about the plot to kill Cesar, but you had to run for your life, mostly because I was Jewish, Rahel said. She shifted positions, and now Yetta could see that her eyes were fierce and blazing. There was a horrible pogrom in Bialstock, houses burning, Jews beaten to death, tossed out of windows and killed. Yetta had known this, known it without wanting to, but she tried not to remember it. And Yetta, it's not safe for mother and father even in the Shetlow, Rahel continued. I've been reading the papers, and it's just a matter of time until the Russians pick our Shetlow, pick our family for the next pogrom. That's why we're saving the money to bring them here, Yetta said as if she were the older sister and Rahel was some small child who needed everything spelled out for her. Rahel gave a harsh laugh. Yes, and do you know how long that would take on our wages? Years and years and years. Unless there's a bad season when we're out of work or there's another strike, and it will take even longer. Yet I hated that Rahel made it sound like it was selfish to have a strike, like it had been selfish of Yetta to take the first ticket to America that Rahel could afford. Why did you go out on strike at all? Yetta demanded in a choked voice. Because I thought it will last a week, Rahel said. I thought we'd get a little more money out of it. I thought... I thought having union would help, but I'm not like you. I don't need the world to know I matter. Yet it jerked back as if she had been slapped. Then why didn't you quit? She asked cruelly. The second week, why didn't you say, oh, well, this isn't working. Back to my machine. They'd beaten you up by then, Rahel said. Everything changed. And then I took the oath. If I turn traitor to this cause, I now pledge, may this hand wither. 
Geta looked down at her right hand, unwithered, but chapped, but badly chapped, cracked along the fingertips because of the cold bruise where she hit the pavement once when the policeman knocked her down. So it's all right to quit now, Yetta asked. You can break the oath if you're getting married. The union settled, Rahel said. I'm not breaking the oath. I'm going on with my life. And Yetta, with Mr. Cohen, will keep kosher. He closes his grocery for the Sabbath. He's a good Jew. Father would be so proud, Yetta said. But she wasn't praising Rahel. She wondered how Rahel could do it. Willingly plunge back into a world where the men made all the decisions, where only their opinions matter, where women just work to help their husbands. Yetta, I won't work in Mr. Cohen's store, Yetta said. I won't live with you, but you're my sister. It was a strangled cry, that, like something ripped from Yetta's throat, from Rahel's throat. Rahel's face twisted painfully, as if holding back her sobs worse than letting them out. I'll stay with Bella, Yetta said. She looked around for her Italian friend, her fellow fervent striker, but Bella had taste tactfully slipped away to let the sisters talk by themselves. Yetta knew how Bella respected family, how she grieved and longed for the sister she lost, the brothers, the mother, the father. And I just shoved my own sister away, Yetta thought with a sudden pang. My sister, my only sister, my only family in America. But she couldn't take anything back. Rahel's the one who's leaving, Yetta reminded herself. Bella and me will, will be fine, Yetta said. Somehow man, she managed to keep the heartache out of her voice. She forged on with false cheer, fake certainty. Fake certainty. Everything will work out. We'll go back to the factory, just not quietly, not meek as mice. And don't worry, I'll still give you money for bringing our family over. Rahel reached, over, reached out for Yetta, then drew, back her, drew her arms back when Yetta flinched. Yetta wondered which argument Rahel was about to throw at her. Maybe, but Bella's not family. She's not even Jewish. Or they'll fire you if you're not meek as mice. Or even, Mr. Cohen and I won't need your money. We'll bring the family over all by ourselves. But Rahel surprised her by clutching her own hand and saying, Don't go back to the triangle. Go to one of the other shops. When that settled early, they agreed to recognize the union. Yetta pulled her hand away. I will go back to Triangle, she said, and it was like taking another vow. I'm not done fighting there. I know how I'll do it. I don't know how I'll do it, but I'm sure I can still do something to change that place. Maybe it was easy for Rahel to give up on the strike, to just walk away. Rahel hadn't been beaten as many times as Jetta had. She hadn't spent as much time on the picket line. She mostly sat in the union office, shuffling papers she hadn't been spat at. She hadn't had a policeman tell her she was the same as a streetwalker. Hadn't the strike made any difference to her at all? I can't stop you, Rahel said, and it was almost like she was saying Yetta wasn't her sister anymore, that she was letting her go. She was agreeing that they would take completely different paths for the rest of their lives. Good. Yetta said, as she turns her face to the wall away from Rahel, so her sister wouldn't see her cry.